Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us the one and only Mike Rinder. Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeffrey. Always a pleasure to be with you. Oh, likewise. The big news. <laughs> oh, the big news, Mike. Season 3, Scientology in the Aftermath. What did you think when you heard the great news? I was very happy, Jeff, that it gives us an opportunity to deal with more issues and uh, like uncover and expose to the world more things that have been going on and do go on in Scientology. You know, the, the, the common theme of what people talk to us about when they talk about the show is I had no idea I had not a clue that this was going on or that that was going on or that this is what Scientologists think or this is how they act. And I think that the the very fact that so much uh, has been done to reveal what is act what actually goes on inside Scientology is, is probably the greatest value of the show and the fact that we're going to be able to do another season's worth of that is very satisfying. I couldn't agree more. One of the things that Aftermath is so good at is educating viewers on what Scientology is. And I, I know when I when I first started sign, studying Scientology, it, it is a big it's a big subject, a big body of work. Yep. But when you start seeing the dark side of Scientology, you're taken into this Alice in Wonderland world where it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And you think, <laughs> how bad is this going to get? And just like we see out here on the Internet, Scientology, when you think it can't get any worse, it does. Right. Yep. It's always worse than you think. Exactly. Now, to counter... Leah and you working on Scientology in the Aftermath as, as the on-air people with your guests. David Miscavige's solution was Scientology TV. What were your impressions of the launch of Scientology TV and, and, and of the project in general? Um, well, I guess my impression, Jeff, is, is, can be summed up in my uh, somewhat derisive term that I now use to describe it as the cult shopping network. Hmm. Um, Scientology, Scientology TV is really uh, one big long infomercial for Scientology. There's nothing sort of new and different other than the very fact that it exists is sort of new and different, I guess you could say. But the truth of the matter is that what what they're putting on the air is same old, same old. It's the stuff that's been on the website. It's the stuff that they've had on their YouTube channel. It's the, the same, uh, you know, run-of-the-mill Scientology propaganda material. And in truth, I believe that the, the value of this to Scientology and Miscavige is sort of similar to the ideal orgs. It is something that is used to persuade those who are still in the Scientology bubble that things are going great, that we are, we are taking the world by storm, that, uh, you know, clearly only uh, an activity that was doing really well could possibly... Uh, be investing that amount of time and effort in their own television network or channel. That, you know, it's funny. It's it's the same thing, like I said, as the ideologues. You, people look at all these buildings and go, well, they must be, and this is what Miscavige relies on. They must be, they must be growing. Look, you know, who would invest 10 or $20 million dollars in buying a building for an organization that isn't actually viable? And the answer to that is Scientology. <laughs> because the answer is it's only for demonstrating 
to the, the sheeple inside the bubble that Scientology is doing great, even though it's not. Yeah, well said. I, for me as a businessman, I look at Scientology TV this way. To your point, they've had all this content on their uh, Scientology YouTube channel for years. Now what they've done is they live stream it on YouTube on Scientology TV. So for the people who don't have direct TV and don't care to turn on channel, whatever it is on direct TV, uh, I look at it, you know, Miscavige spent $45 million to buy the KCET lot. Pry dumped in 30 or $40 million to upgrade it, plus equipment, plus this launch. So yeah. I, look at, I look at it, I agree with you that it is a, an internal propaganda device to convince the people that their Scientology is succeeding, right? But from a business mm -hmm. perspective, it's strictly a $100 million YouTube channel. It is the world's most expensive YouTube channel. And I think yeah. that I think that the Church of Scientology, if we're honest, would give its parishioners t-shirts that said, I helped donate for a $100 million YouTube channel, and all I got was this t-shirt. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not cynical, but I'm brutally honest as a businessman. Uh, I, I hear you, Jeff. I mean, honestly, the, the, this thing is uh, something else also that I firmly believe is driven by the necessity of Scientology to spend a bunch of its disposable cash on things that are considered to be exempt purposes for the IRS. That, that, that this is a constant problem for Scientology is literally they make too much money and do not spend it on charitable exempt purpose activities. And this leads to a conundrum for Scientology of literally, what do we do with our money? Where are we going to spend our money? Because we can't keep accumulating it and still be in compliance with IRS requirements. So Miscavige and, and Scientology, based on the Hubbard principles, it's, it's uh, considered to be a very, very poor form to spend money on something that you're not getting a return for. And almost by definition, charitable activities require no return. You know, if you're going to go out and, and spend money to uh, shelter the homeless or provide food for homeless people or something, you're not going to get anything back for that. And in, in the Scientology mindset, that is a, a terrible, terrible waste of good money. So Miscavige has to come up with these things to spend money on that are going to maintain the revenue or maintain that income within their control. And that's why you see these buildings being purchased, which have no real use. They're not needed by anyone for anything, except when the IRS comes around, the IRS can't really go well, we don't believe that you really need this building because that would, on its face at least, be a violation of the separation of church and state. They're not supposed to be inquiring into, into whether an organization, a, a religious organization, needs a building or not. That, that would be interpreted particularly by Scientology as being way beyond the scope of the IRS mandate. So that's one way you see them buying buildings and similarly advertising like what is done on, on the uh, cult shopping network is exactly the same sort of expenditure. You know, there are religious organizations that have had TV shows and TV channels and fundraising, etc., etc., and it's a fairly accepted Thing for religious organizations 
to spend money on that and not really challengeable by the IRS. So dumping $100 million into a, a YouTube channel or a glorified YouTube channel makes absolutely no sense to anybody else in the world and makes every bit of sense from the Scientology world because that can then be used to persuade people to give even more money. Look at the great work we're doing. Look at how successful we are on getting people engaged and involved in Scientology, which, you know, that's a separate question, but that's how they promote it to their internal public. Yeah, that, that your, your perspective is so interesting because it, it is true on several points. The IRS does not allow tax exempt organizations to accumulate ex excess capital. That is, they can't hoard money. So in a very self-serving way, Scientology is able to uh, increase its real estate portfolio by buying buildings. And the IRS can't comment on that, as you say. And it's able to meet the burden that we're spending money in the public benefit uh, to whose benefit and who it benefits is another question you know, altogether. <laughs> it's not really benefiting uh, much of anybody. Uh, the church would disagree with me, but uh, nevertheless. So, so it is kind of a way to meet their regulatory burden of spending money and not accumulating excess capital while adding to their enormous real estate portfolio. And Mike, what's so paradoxical is, is the more real estate Scientology amasses, the more it continues to implode. It's a bizarre paradox. So that at some point when they own as much real estate as they can, then they will collapse, I suppose. Well, I suppose too. I mean, people often ask that question, Jeffrey, like, what's it going to take? How much, how long is this? Thing gonna last? How can it keep going like this when it's clearly failing? And the answer to that is three plus billion dollars will keep you going for a long time. That is a lot of money. And you know, you you can keep a failing organization going for a, a considerable period of time with more than a billion dollars, let alone multiple billions of dollars. So sure. it's it's not going to disappear in any big hurry. But the truth of the matter is, it's disappearing at a consistent, measurable, um, unchanging, unwavering rate. Scientology is not growing anywhere in the world except perhaps Taiwan, oddly, oddly Taiwan. Yes, and that's what? where they're, they're doing a lot of uh, focus on business, how to increase your, your personal wealth. Right. Uh, you know, handle self-help. And so it's something novel in that part of the world, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. Now, Mike, changing gears a little bit, I want to talk about the, the pure hypocrisy of, of Church of Scientology. They're putting out Scientology TV to present a happy face to the world, and I've watched enough of it now to see its smiling faces, and it's the usual stuff where literacy, anti-drugs, we saved Columbia. That story, we saved Columbia from collapse and ruin, you know, right? We turn it around with a way to happiness. And, yeah. and, all, and all the usual PR nonsense. But, but what I'm also seeing online, you're seeing Scientology is engaged in vicious, fair game attacks on Scientology in the aftermath. Leah Remini, you, Tony Ortega, the guests on Aftermath. I mean, this is so schizophrenic to be saying we have a TV show, see how happy we are, while they're engaging in vicious character assassination libel, slander, everything else, fair what we call fair game. Right. Now, that the public is seeing this. This doesn't reconcile. It doesn't match. That's my what I want to tell listeners is, look, don't look at what they're doing on Scientology TV. Look at what they're doing in reality. Go online and look at their hate websites. 
you know, I mean, what, what, how do they think they're going to pull this off? Do they think people are that stupid? It, that's a fascinating question, Jeffrey. Do they think that people are that stupid? It's, uh, you've got to assume that the answer to that question is yes, they do, because they keep doing it. But then, on the other hand, I'm, I'm not totally convinced that that is true and that it isn't really more a reflection of the, the mindset of Scientology and everything about Scientology, which is it's dictated by what L. Ron Hubbard laid out must be done. So therefore, we just do it. And even though every every rational thought and every every inclination would be you know this is crazy what are we doing the idea that l ron hubbard knew better and understood the world and people better than anybody else ever in the history of the universe sort of overrides common sense and what i mean by that is People will do things, like crazy things, on the basis that even though it seems stupid to them, L. Ron Hubbard said this is what you're going to do or what you should do. So they believe that if they do it and they keep persisting and doing it, that eventually it's going to turn out good for them because L. Ron Hubbard said it will. And... No matter how many times it's proven that th that this sort of in insanity produces nothing other than trouble, they keep doing it. And you got to go, well, why do they keep doing it? What is it that motivates them to keep doing the same insane, literally crazy stuff? And the only real answer that anybody who's ever been in Scientology understands very well is that's what Ron says. So we do it in the faith that if we keep doing what Ron says, everything's going to turn out okay in the end. And, you know, it's, it's like wacky. Yeah, it, it, it's self-destructive, too. You, you, you would think that they would... Um hire um, a public relations firm because they're, you know, uh, Ron Hubbard was big on surveys, right? And you would think they'd hire a public relations firm to say, how, how are we being perceived? <clears throat> how credible will Scientology TV be? What should we do? Because that, you know, actually, Mike, if you, if you look at it, these people are, are, are indoctrinated heavily indoctrinated to believe that they must destroy their enemies under a doctrine called fair game. And L. Ron Hubbard said you have to depopularize, right. depopularize the enemy to the point of total oblivion, if possible. Obliteration. Remember. Yeah, obliteration. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, depopularize the enemy to the point of total obliteration, if possible, ruin them utterly. So they're acting on the principle of we must ruin those who speak out against us utterly. We must ruin them while on the other hand, we have to put out this false front PR that we're happy and succeeding and prosperous. Now, in the mind right. of a, a Scientologist, that goes together, that fits. They don't, they don't see the schizophrenia of it or, or the damage it's doing to their own organizations. Correct. Not at all. Like I said, they look at everything through the prism of what did LRH say? What was it that he said was the way to deal with this? Because if we just keep doing that, everything's going to be hunky-dory. And it can be completely insane, and they will carry on like, like it makes perfect sense to keep doing the same stuff that causes problems over and over and over. And... Frankly, to those of us who are working to end the abuses of Scientology, that's one of the one of the, the wonderful things to always remember. 
they're never going to get smart enough to change because mm. they can't. They, they, they just can't. So it's all there is going to be an endless supply, if you like, of insanity for those who wish to expose the abuses of Scientology to make current news out of. They, they just keep doing it, and it, they're never going to stop. You're correct. It's predictable. Mike, sometimes Scientology hands us things on a silver platter. The Squirrel Busters were a perfect example of when I saw those people show up with cameras on their heads. Yeah. I thought, this is insane, but thank you for showing us, the world, how insane you are. We, we, didn't, we don't need to right. do anything. It was almost as e it was almost as easy as cow tipping, you know, you uh, just tipping over a sleeping cow, right? And yeah. the squirrel buster showed up here. One of them drove their own car to the house here, and, and we got his license plate. We were able to find out who he was. He, he was on the internet before he got home, and then they started coming in rental cars, right? Because yeah. I thought they would be smarter, so we took pictures of them and put them up. I'm thinking, you're not even doing this well. This, this part of Fair Game Well, you're not even doing it well. Mike, I want to ask you, in your, in your final days in the Church of Scientology, there's a picture of you with your arms are crossed, and this was when, when John Sweeney was filming. And yeah. it's, it's a very complex mood you're showing. You're in a, you're in a doorway, you know, and you're talking to John Sweeney. Uh, yeah. you, look, you look malnourished. You do look like I a was. <laughs> you, do, you, you do look like a POW, sleep deprived. But but when I first saw that, I thought it's getting to him. This is getting to Mike Rinder. When did your when does your cognitive dissonance begin that this, doing the same thing over and over is not working? What what series of events causes you to blow to escape from the church and save your life? Um. Well, it was a long time coming, Jeff. Like, it didn't happen with one event. But certainly, there was an event that kind of precipitated the final act of walking out the door, which was uh, being confronted by John Sweeney in the, in the entrance to the test center of the London org in Tottenham Court Road and being asked point blank by Sweeney to respond to claims that David Miscavige had physically assaulted me. And when I'm standing there denying these things and threatening and telling Sweeney I'm going to, you know, we're going to sue them back to the Stone Age or whatever it was that was being said. I'm thinking, and he's going, yeah, but I've got eyewitnesses that have told me this. And people who have said that they saw this happening. And I'm standing there saying, nope, this is all just lies. It's lies. And I knew that it was absolutely 100% true. I... I had for a long time been able to justify certain things that I was willing to tell an acceptable truth about. And those were things that I believed were in the best interest of protecting Scientology. Like, you know, I'm sitting there with Katie Couric and she's asking me about OT3 and I'm a, a Scientologist's a devout Scientologist, and I'm thinking, if I say anything here, I'm going to be putting the lives of individuals in danger by confirming something that I know is improper to do based on the, the tenets of Scientology. And I could justify that. And when I sat down and started thinking after that encounter with John, what am I doing? Why am I justifying and explaining and excusing and pretending that this stuff doesn't happen? This has nothing to do with why I joined the SEA organization in the first place. This has nothing to do with 
saving the planet from the evils of psychiatry or all the other things that I believed in at the time. This is so far divergent from the reality of this is why I am a Scientologist that it suddenly I just kind of cracked and went you know what I know that taking an action uh, in disagreement or you know like stepping outside of of this and walking away from it is going to cost me uh, my children, my wife, my my entire family. Um, I will have nothing. I will be walking away from everything that I have known my entire life and having to figure out how to start fresh. And at that moment, that was a better option to me than continuing to do what I had been doing. And it's sort of, a, I guess, a, an indication of how bad it has to get that it took that level of, of pressure, that level of feeling like there was no other choice uh, being willing to give away everything and give up everything that I, I had in my entire life to break free of this. And I don't know if that's a good answer to the question. It's, it's far more complex than, you know, you can easily describe to anyone. And there was a lot of, a lot of, um, sort of emotions and 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 things that you that go through your mind and and things that you think about and consider when making a choice like that but that's a, a sort of a as good a summary as I can give to what happened and why and I, and I appreciate you sharing that it's it's a very intense honest answer and in, in, look, in the spiritual traditions of the world, and, and Jesus said this, I'm not a Christian, but there is wisdom in this saying, Jesus said that you have to lose your life in order to find it. And, and basically, you can find the same teaching in Buddhism, you know, other, other schools, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things you have to lose your life. You have to give up everything to, to really save your sanity, save your life. And one reason... This is important to discuss, is you know and I know that people in Scientology's Office of Special Affairs are listening to this podcast. <laughs> and so your former colleagues are listening to it. And I have to think sometimes they know what's going on and they're living with the same nightmare tension. Yeah. How bad is it and how do, how do they live with it? And I, for you to sh honestly share your heart of how intense it was for you, they have some of them have to be feeling that way. Uh, it, I mean, it's hard. I, to I believe so, Jeff. Yeah. I, I, I definitely believe so. And it, it's part of the reason why, uh, you know, I, I keep going, doing what I do. And it, there is this sort of hope that eventually everybody is going to to sort of see the light and come to their senses and that's a bit of a uh, you know it's it sounds a little flippant to say that and of course there are a lot of people that would say well you know who are you to judge what someone else should should or shouldn't think and how they should or shouldn't view the world. Well, I guess I figure that I'm in a position to judge because I have walked in those shoes. Uh, it, it's not like I'm just a, a someone that has never had the experience and never seen the the other side of this equation and and uh, just pontificating about it. I lived this and experienced it very very dramatically and 
I feel a kind of an obligation to see if I can't do something to help other people to extricate themselves from the same circumstances that I found myself in. Because I can assure you and anybody else that listens and anybody in OSA that is listening that despite what you are told about how terrible things are, if you ever stray from the, the path of righteousness in Scientology, it is absolutely the, the most freeing. If you, if you truly are looking for spiritual freedom and happiness, I have one word of advice for you. Walk the fuck out of Scientology. Because that will give you more freedom and happiness than anything that you will find in there and that you have been working, slaving to try and accomplish. And it's for one simple reason, in my view. As soon as you walk away from Scientology, you gain the freedom of choice, the freedom to make your own decisions, the freedom to decide what is and isn't the right thing to do in your life and to be happy or not happy or live your life the way that you choose to. The problem, in my view, the overriding principle of, upon which every Scientologist lives their life is they are dictated what's right and what's wrong. They are told what every decision should and should not be, and it is all based on the, the writings and the, quote, scriptures of Scientology laid out by L. Ron Hubbard. And everything, every decision, down to how you wash the damn windows and whether you should have sex in the missionary position and what you should what you should and shouldn't do with, with a pregnant woman and anything and everything is is answered quote unquote in Scientology and that is a terrible way of trying to attain personal freedom terrible it, it, it's it's the complete opposite of freedom it's oppression it's tyranny Mike, one thing that that I wanted to ask you, and, and, I, and this is by way of educating new Scientology watchers and listeners, and this yeah. goes to, to what you were saying to the tyranny that, that you're dictated and ordered about. When I watch Scientology in the aftermath, well, and I hear former members sharing the grief and the pain and, and the misery they've been through, something that goes on in the church is the church is so compartmentalized and f so compartmentalized that you're not allowed to share this terrible burden with anyone else. That right. You can't. You can't. And that one Scientologist may not say to another, "Hey, this is really horrible. This is just fucked, and I'm miserable." You could never come out and say that. No. Because of the penalties, so nobody, even married couples, don't know. How, how much they're suffering, how miserable they are. Instead, they have to present this this PR friend that they're happy. Correct. So, so when everything, and I'll give you an example. Let's go into the auditing session. When you go into an auditing session in a church of Scientology, that's the only place you can really talk about things, right? And even then, yeah. it's not safe because if anything's out of ethics, the auditor can write it up, correct? Yes, absolutely. No, not can, is expected to. So if, if, if I'm a Scientologist and I went in and I, and I, I said, well, I, I took money from work or, you know, I cheated on my wife or, wh or whatever, that gets written up to ethics, correct? Correct. And it's used against you. And then when I come out of session, I can't talk about my auditing session to my wife, my friends. If we were both in Scientology, we couldn't talk about what's going on in our auditing sessions. Correct. We can't talk That's about exactly what, right. So we can't talk about what went on in a security check, a reg cycle. Any any negative speech is called nattering or in theta. Yep. 
And how? And, how and is- uh, truthfully, Jeff, you know, when you when you give the example of well, someone's stolen money or something, I think that that's a bit a bit uh, of a poor example to give. And I'm not trying to criticize you. I'm just don't want people to get the wrong impression. If sure, someone please. has done something that someone has done something like stealing or you know uh, seducing someone else's wife or something I do think that it is appropriate that action be taken to remedy those things and that someone should be taking responsibility for it where I disagree and where Scientology becomes incredibly oppressive is if you say anything that indicates in any way that you have a disagreement, that you have uh, an objection to anything that L. Ron Hubbard has ever said, anything that the organization does, anything that even down to you may be paying $8,000 to an auditor to to, uh, give you a few hours of auditing, and if you are upset about how they have conducted that auditing, then it's just going to be held against you, not held against the organization or the auditor. And that then breeds an environment in which nobody is ever able to express their real views. And nobody is able to talk to anybody else about what's going on. There is no uh, criticism that is allowed. There is no discussion about whether things are right or wrong. It is all assumed to be 100% right when it comes from L. Ron Hubbard and the Scientology organization. And anybody that says anything different, they're in deep caca. And that is what makes Scientology so oppressive and so... And when you get away from that, and being able to actually have your own thoughts and not be told how to think of what you must think and how you must act and what you must do and what's right and what's wrong in every tiny detail of your life, that is the most freeing thing that there is in the world. Sure, to have the freedom of your own thoughts, to not yep. have things be thought crimes. That's exactly now, right. Now, your point, Mike, is well taken that matters of substance, you know, for example, embezzlement, adultery, whatever, you know, those are matters of substance about which something needs to be done. However, in Scientology, you're not allowed to contact the police about things, as I understand it. So, for example, sexual abuse. It gets covered up inside the church, does it not? Yes, routinely. Um, And there is is very clear policy about... Well, let let me go back a bit, Jeff, because this one always gets like... uh, It's easy to misinterpret. And the the first concept that must be understood in order to really grasp this is... Scientologists believe what L. Ron Hubbard told them to believe, which is governments, the court system, quote, WOG justice is all bad. They only hurt people. They do not help anyone. The system of, of justice in, in the world outside Scientology is rigged to create criminals. And this is what Scientologists truly believe. They believe that having someone end up in the hands of the justice system is tantamount to a death sentence, but not just a death sentence for one lifetime, a death sentence for all lifetimes into the future. It's a horrible thing. You may end up in the hands of psychiatry. You may be given psychiatric drugs. At the very least, you will be um, treated with disdain, without care, and there will be no hope 
of solving the underlying problem that caused you to fall into the hands of law enforcement in the first place. That if you are a sex offender, for example, the only thing that will deal with your proclivities to have uh, inappropriate sexual contact with children is Scientology. That it will be exacerbated and made worse if you get into the hands of the authorities. That if law enforcement, if, if you're unfortunate enough to, to be gotten by law enforcement and put into the, to the uh, court system and ultimately the penal system, you are doomed and that this is a terrible fate to befall a Scientologist. So, given all that, the idea that the first thought is to report anything that you know of or see to the church, not to law enforcement, becomes more understandable. And that is what every Scientologist thinks that their responsibility is. Let OSA no, let the MAA know, let the church know, and let them deal with it. And then you get to the next level. The church as an institution, or Scientology as an institution, has one view. What's good for Scientology is the right thing. If turning someone over to law enforcement is going to result in negative publicity for Scientology, that's a no-no. And I don't care what the circumstances are. If they can avoid turning someone over to law enforcement and avoid a PR flap, they will avoid it. There is, it's not even a, a gray area. It is simply what's good for Scientology and the PR of Scientology is the right thing to do. And so you have circumstances whereby Scientologists or, or people who are involved in Scientology or with Scientology children have been found to be engaged in inappropriate sexual contact with those children, and the church will pull the parents in and persuade them not to file complaints with law enforcement because the church is, quote-unquote, going to take care of it and if you turn this person over, it will become bad PR for the church. And also, this person will be doomed to eternity. And the only hope that they have of getting cured of their pedophilia is, is going to be lost to them. And that is Scientology PR handling 101. Mike, I'm glad you shared that. That's one of the most important clarifications ever. And it's it's very subtle because L. Ron Hubbard teaching that it's a horrible fate to fall into the hands of the police because you could be subjected to psychiatric treatment. Yep. Is the next layer over is we have to protect the reputation and PR of the Church of Scientology. In other words, we can't let the public know we have this type of person inside the church. Right. Therefore, there is a cover up. The underlying reason is within Scientology that that the police are evil and, and we can't possibly turn our members over to the police. So this is this shows Scientology's inherent distrust of government. Oh, yeah. And that's that's throughout the writings of Oran Hubbard. Oh, he had complete disdain for for the government. In fact, his his. Um, Social engineering program, he said, someday somebody will say what is what is legal. By then, make sure Scientology orgs say what is the law. Words right. to that effect. So he wanted to establish Scientology as the law of the land. And right, because, because his system of ethics and justice is the only system of ethics and justice that is actually valid, fair, just, and right. And, and turning to a, a, something less intense than child molestation, which the Church of Scientology has covered up, and, and you and Leah have so courageously covered on the show, 
And I've watched, by the way, Mike, I've watched the church's reactions to this. They do not like being exposed. They do not like their dirty deeds exposed to the light. And uh, again, no. for... <laughs> that's an understatement, Jeff. <laughs> the, oh, but, no, but, no kidding. But, but what I think is even more uh, uh, more relevant is whether they like it or they don't, the one thing they never do is actually respond. They never address any of the issues. All they do is seek to smear the people that recount their experiences. That is it. Exactly. That was the point uh, Leah and I discussed in our interview, our recent interview. Yeah. And Leah made a few good points that the, uh, the Church of Scientology should bear in mind. One, people like us are not going away. We will continue to expose what the church does. And the Church of Scientology, instead of responding to criticisms, it, it reflexively, per LRH policy, engages in character assassination. And, and that's the malicious thing, and that's what the public needs to watch. Your guests on Scientology in the Aftermath talk about horrendous things that were done to them. Right. The church never said, yes, we did, we, we used child labor, there was sexual molestation, we did bankrupt people, we do use slave labor in the Sea Org. They'll never say that, they'll say the people, and this is on Scientology Anthem Matthew book, and it with disclaimers, the church denies everything and everyone on the show. Well, well, to your point, that doesn't address the actual eyewitness, the actual victim, the actual person to whom it happened. Right. So. So then the church becomes an, a lie. The entire Church of Scientology becomes a lie because it'll engage in character assassination rather than confronting the truth. And Hubbard was always about confront, confront, confront. Do you have a confront of evil? Can you confront the truth? Right. And they, they obviously, they can't. Hence their reaction to the show. And that's why I'm seeing this increased tempo of fair game when season three was announced. You could see... Yeah. The, the paranoia and fear is, oh my God, not season three, anything but that. And uh, Yeah, exactly, Jeff. That's exactly right. It, it's like, you know, uh, there are many uh, conversations that are happening inside Scientology that I envisage in my head uh, when I see the result. And they go sort of like this. Someone reports to David Miscavige that they've just announced season three or he's looking on the internet or whatever and he screams at the top of his lungs get me the and I'll, I'll leave out all the expletives but get me the, those OSA people on the phone and Warren McShane what the hell are you people doing what are you doing about this and they blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I, so we blah, 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 blah. You've got 24 hours to get something done or you're dead beat. So they run off and do crazy stuff. In order to be able, literally, to just respond, well, we put a PI on them. Oh, we went, we, we sent someone out to visit their family members. Or we did this, or we did that, so that it's not, the response is not just, so we've done nothing, but, so we've done this. And then they'll be told, well, that's stupid, that's wrong, you know, everything they do is always wrong, but it's better to be accused of doing something wrong than accused of doing nothing, and that you are leaving the chairman of the board hung out to dry with nobody doing anything to defend him, which is his constant refrain. You know, I'm the only person that ever looks out, have to, you know, protect my own image, and you guys don't do anything, and I'm being attacked all the time, and blah, 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 blah. And you see these, these kooky things happening, and in the minds of the people that instigate them, the Gavino Itas or the, the Linda Hamels or the Charlie Earls or whoever they are, they're going, what the hell am I going to do now? I have no clue. Okay, so someone comes in uh, from RTC and says, what does LRH say? 
here's what the here's the reference and so they pull out you know uh intelligence principles or counterattack tactics or one of those writings from hubbard and it says do this and do that and hire private investigators and investigate their backgrounds and go after their family and find what their buttons are and blah 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 so these people frantically do that anything and, and it doesn't really matter what it is and it doesn't matter what the ramifications are because the ramifications in the real world, in their universe, is less problematic than the ramification of being sent to the hole tomorrow. Or hmm. tonight, being made to stay up all night and scrub a dumpster with a toothbrush. So they do insane things, and they keep doing insane things, because they believe that those insane things are saving them from some terrible fate. And to some extent, it's true. And ultimately, they've got to come to the realization that this insanity that you know is insanity, you are the only one that can stop it. And the only way in the context of where they are, you know, their life, that they can stop it is to walk away from it. Because they can't stop it institutionally. There's no... There's no vehicle, there's no way of changing the institution and changing the way business is done in Scientology. No, nobody can change that. That's dictated by L. Ron Hubbard. And he's dead. He's gone. He ain't writing any new stuff saying don't do this anymore. So they're stuck. And the only solution that they have is to get out. And... That's kind of the message that I have to them, the host of people that are having to listen to this podcast now to find everything that I say in here that they're going to put in Freedom Magazine and say, oh, he lied about this and he told the, he said this was blah, 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 and did you know that he beats his wife and he's this and blah, blah, blah. But those guys that are having to listen to this, think about what I'm saying because the truth, of, you know and those people do know they're just caught in a in a what seems to be a, a, a rat wheel with no door. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem that there is any way of getting off this treadmill that they just have to keep running faster and faster and faster. And they've been doing it for years, and they just in their eyes. The only way out is basically to take a leap out the window and hope that there is someone at the bottom to catch them. Sooner or later, they're going to do it. But why stick around for more pain? <laughs> yes, and this goes to, to, to my next question, the Aftermath Foundation. Why was it created and what, what is its purpose it was created, Jeff, because there are so many people who reach out to the show, and just in general, on Facebook, Antonio Ortega's blog, and various other places saying, what can we do to help? We feel for you people. We feel for the people that are trying to get out of Scientology. We feel for the people that walk away from the Sea Organization with no resume, no bank account, no driver's license, no nothing, and try and start a life anew. Can we help? And there has not been any sort of, uh, I, can't, I can't think of the right word, aggregation uh, vehicle to put together all of the people who want to help uh, and I, sure. I don't mean just give money. I mean offer their services, offer to help people write a resume, a room to stay in, uh, a place to, to go, uh, transport, whatever. That the idea was, let's see if we can put something together that will match up the desire of people to help and the need of people for help. And we have had an enormous outpouring of, of assistance and offered assistance from a lot of people, and we're trying to get it all organized and 
you know, a lot of people have sent money, and we are now uh, in the process of and have sort of made, okay, here is exactly what, here's the sort of people that we're looking for to help, and here is how you can apply for help from the foundation, and we're trying to get it all organized and put into into a well-oiled machine. Sure, so that when somebody leaves the Church of Scientology, perhaps especially the C organization, it, it helps them to get back on their feet in life. Exactly. That's exactly the purpose. And, and, and that's a noble, simple charity. That is charity. Absolutely. There's no, there's, no, there's no purpose for this other than to help other people. They're not, it ain't helping us. We're already out. But uniquely, I think, Jeffrey, the people who have left, particularly the ones who've left the Sea Organization, every single one I know of leaned on someone to help them at the outset. They reached out to someone and managed to find someone to help them, whether it was to just give them a place to stay, whether it was their family. Some of them didn't have family. Some of them had to rely on friends. Some of them had to rely on people who had uh, they had been associated with in the C organization who had left previous to them. But there has always been this sort of good Samaritan informal network that has existed to help such people and we are simply trying to make it a little better organized and be able to help more people. And, and, and for that I applaud you and I, I just going earlier Mick Wenlock started XSO years ago. Yeah. Uh, 15 years ago and that was an early attempt and Mick Wenlock did something great like you need a couch, a place to sleep, so you're not homeless. You have a Mick Wenlock is, is, is a wonderful man, Jeffrey. I knew Mick from my days in the Sea Org, and I did some missions with him, and he is one of the true salts of the earth, as is his wife, and the, the way that he leads his life is a, a wonderful example to a lot of people. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Mick Wenlock is a, a prince of a man. He, he and his wife and what they've done to help. And I, one of the wonderful outcomes of Scientology in the aftermath is the Aftermath Foundation that exists to help. That's actually putting your money where your mouth is. It's actually putting into practice charity, actual good works that help people who need help, altruism done out of a done out of a desire to help and I and I I think it's a tremendous thing that the show has done wish you and Leah all the best for season three the courage the heart the brains that go into the show it's just remarkable to see this played out in real life and the fact is David Miscavige you're not going to stop it well, that's, that's very true, and I appreciate that, Jeff. But i got to say, and, the same, and, and I have exactly the same sentiment as Leah does, without the people who have been so willing to help with this series, and by that I mean the contributors who have come on the show and the people who have worked to support and help us in the background like yourself and Karen and Aaron and Tony Ortega and Chris Shelton. And there is a whole world of people out there who we rely upon to assist us. You know how many times I or people from the production call <laughs> you, Jeffrey, and call Karen or call Chris Shelton or call Aaron or call this or call... Like, we are constantly constantly relying on the the people out there that support the show and you should never be never be forgotten because without your help and the willingness of, of brave people to come on the program which also includes you and Karen and Chris and Aaron but there is a lot there is a world of people out there who are a part of this this team and we really do view it as a team 
that this is a, a an effort of like-minded individuals to achieve a common goal and purpose. And I just want to take the opportunity to once again thank you and thank everybody else who has ever helped us with anything and who will continue to help us in the future because it couldn't be done literally without you. Well, thank you for the kind words, Mike. I, I appreciate it. And those of us who work with the show to help appreciate it because what, what, what you and Lee have done is to catalyze something. It's really been a catalyst. It's been a focus. So when you see how hard it is to do television and, and, and to do world-class television that wins an Emmy and you're a part of it, you, there's something that makes you feel good that, that you are helping, that you are getting the word out. And right. And it doesn't matter what this cult of Scientology does because our determination is greater than theirs. Mike, this has been a tremendous interview. I'm so, I'm so glad you shared your heart with listeners, clarified things. I look forward to season three. Thank you for, for being on the show. Uh, oh, you're very yours. welcome, Jeff. No, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to you. I find our conversations are always engaging and interesting and stimulating for me to think about things and, and give my perspective about them. I, uh, I'm sure I'll be seeing you pretty soon. Good. Look forward to it. And thank you for coming on the show and for Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. As always, we'll be in very good touch.